I'm going to talk about properties and bindings in modern C++. Uh, why? Well, I work at a software consulting company called KDAB. Uh, got the logo up there, and you can see at the bottom it says the Qt OpenGL and C++ experts. So we do a lot of consulting around Qt, not Qt, mm, uh, and we do a lot around non-Qt stuff with C++ and with OpenGL and things. So we use Qt and we like Qt, but we don't use Qt all the time. But Qt does have some nice pieces. Again, this may be a controversial topic, but you know, bits of Qt keep ending up in the standard, so some bits of Qt are nice. But clearly, people don't like the naming. Uh, one really big bit of Qt that we like is it has a complete embedded declarative language for describing related properties. And this is used in the user interface layer of Qt quite extensively to make building UIs in a declarative way. And there's a school of thought, which is not a, necessarily a kind of universal school of thought, that for user interfaces, a declarative description of when things are enabled, how big they should be, what color they should be, et cetera, is quite a good way to build UIs. It fits more nicely with how designers tend to specify user interface in terms of enable, disable states, that kind of stuff, uh, and a bunch of other things as well. So many UI languages, but not all, hence things like ImGUI existing, think the declarative description of your, your UI can be quite a good way to work, and Qt's got a system for that. So we were working on a, and increasingly are on, non-Qt based projects, uh, and we were building some very large code bases where we didn't use Qt, and we were like, oh, we're kind of missing having the, uh, the, the properties and the declarative features of Qt. Can we create them ourselves? So we had a go at that, and this talk is basically what we ended up with. And we just start with some building blocks. So before we can get to the fun stuff, which is the declarative properties and bindings, we have to get signals and properties working first which are a standard feature in Qt, but they're not standard in C++. But they have been done by many other people. So even back in the day of C++ 98, there was libsig C++, which I used a bit and, and worked. And there's also boost signals, which I guess is the most common example of signals. So we have the signal slot idiom, where you define a signal that pr produces some kind of event or information, and you have slots, which are kind of the consumers or callbacks attached to it. So it's a very nice paradigm in an event-driven asynchronous system. You have independent objects communicating. You can, if you do it in the C++ way, you can have type-safe parameters. You can get all your nice type conversion rules. Uh, and the basic concept is you have a signal object. Uh, you, declare, you say that you emit a signal, and everything connected to that will then receive a notification. And one of the big things that really helped with C++ 11 onwards, and this was picked up in Qt as well as in everywhere else that uses defined signals, is that uh, a slot can be anything you can call with operator parenthesis, and that includes lambdas, which suddenly made the whole thing get 10 times nicer, because now you could just go and basically connect to a lambda direct directly, and you're on clicked, or on print, or on open, or whatever it is, uh, event handler. So that's pretty nice, um, but nothing new here. There's nothing here that we did that you can't do in boost signals. It's just you know, this, a, a similar implementation. Uh, yeah. Signals have arbitrary arguments, which you can specify when emitting. So you can say a signal has an integer parameter, and when you emit it, you provide that parameter. And when you're connecting, you can also provide arguments to the connecting function. But the really important thing here is this means you can trivially connect to member functions, because of course your member function has this implicit first argument, which is this pointer, and if you can supply that as a parameter to your connect, then you can just basically get this nice binding between objects. And that falls out really nicely. I'll show some code in a second. But again, nothing new here, all the same as everything else. So then we have another completely non-new non thing, which is properties. Um, again, you've, there's property systems going back to you know, MSC and before everywhere, really. Uh, so we need a property to be able to do declarative properties and bindings as we're going to see. So this is a, a primary valued property. And it's basically a template on any other type, integer, string, uh, a struct, whatever it might be. And essentially, it just wraps the value and gives you get and set functions. Uh, nothing big there. And of course, that's nice, but we want to you know, work in a slightly more C++-friendly way. So we can overload the assignment operator and the conversion operators for our value type and get conversion back and forth. And this means a lot of places you can then use your property as if it was just a plain value of that type. Life is good. But the critical thing we're going to add here, and again, when you say a property, you can mean various different features, but the one that we really care about here, which combines with signals, is change notifications. 
So you can be told when a property is about to change and get the old value in the new one, and when it has changed and then get the updated value. There's also a destruction signal in there and some other features, but not really worth worrying about. And it's this change notification that enables the bindings features we're going to talk about. So just a quick example of the code. Uh, I'll show some more in-depth examples if I have time. But you can declare a signal with no type parameters or some. This one has none. It's called clicked. We can declare a controller class, which re responds to, for example, this widget and has just some methods. Uh, and then we can connect them together. And this is the very common syntax you'll see is just doing a connect on a signal uh, and then using a member function. So therefore, we have a member function pointer. And then the second argument is the instance. And everything else. Actually, I might be missing an ampersand there. I was just typing this up quickly. So this is the normal connect syntax you'll see. Nothing new under the sun, same as in other connect libraries. Um, and for using properties, uh, again, you create them inside probably a class as members with a type, and then you can use them as that plain value type. Uh, but again, every single property has a value change signal, which we can connect to, and therefore be notified when the property changes. Cool. So simple, so boring, fine. I, I actually don't know why there isn't like a standard kind of boost property to go alongside boost signals, because it seems kind of obvious. Again, this is nothing especially innovative here. The innovative thing, as far as we're concerned, or the thing we want to replicate that we miss when we don't have it, is bindings. Uh, and this brings us to the idea of primary versus secondary state. So why would consider the properties we just saw uh, for a widget, it might be width and height uh, and XY position as primary state. Well, also whether or not it's enabled and disabled, for example. Um, and it's very, very common, having had that primary state, to have a whole bunch of secondary state. And the classic example is if a, wid a widget might be visible or invisible, but if its parent widget is invisible, like the dialogue it's in, it's definitely invisible. Or if its parent is disabled, it's definitely disabled. And there's other ones like, you know, the width of a group box might depend on the width of the text field inside it, because it's going to be the width of the inner side thing plus the margins on either side, and so forth. So this kind of cascading of values uh, through the system. It, it happens in many places, uh, not just user interface, but it's maybe the one where it kind of stands out the most. Uh, so the actual motivating example of this was a 3D rendering engine, where again, you have lots of, you set this, but it has that, and then this changes, because that's computed from this, and so forth, and so forth. And the thing this works well for is things where the rate of change is moderate. If you have a simulation environment where every value is updated every single frame at 100 hertz or 60 hertz, you typically don't care about this kind of system because you just basically, you have numbers and you recompute them continuously at, at full rate. But in a user interface, that's much less common. More likely, buttons don't become invisible and invisible every frame. They don't change size and shape every frame. It's an infrequent event, but when it happens, you need to do a lot of work. And, and the cascading wavefront of changes from this thing got bigger to all these things resized, or this thing got disabled, or, the, or this text is now an invalid length, and therefore we should disable that button because it's no longer a valid IP address and it didn't follow the formatting rule, and now all these fields are disabled. All those kind of reactive things in UIs, they don't happen very often, but when they do happen, a lot of things need to be updated. And the real thing is that propagating those changes correctly is always a chore. The UX designer will always say, these four fields become invalid when this is not a valid IP address. But actually going and looking that up is the pain. So since it's a chore, we're going to automate it. So that's what bindings give us. It's a read-only property computed from operations on other properties. So there's a trivial example here of C is a bound property, and it's A times B plus a literal value. And a really obvious practical one here we have is area is width times height. Um, you can also imagine for a rectangle that the right-hand edge's position is the width plus the x value. If either the width or the x value change, the right-hand edge moves, and, and so forth. But not just numerical stuff. So you can have a, uh, a string in uppercase, which you get by applying you know, a two-upper string on a base property, or an elided one that has a maximum length, and beyond that, it's got the dot, dot, dot after it. All these are secondary values derived from primary ones. They can be a read-only property, or what we call a bound property. Uh, and then visibility and enabled are the other classic ones where you've got some chain of enable it if this and this, but not that and this and that. 
And again, each of those can be combined. And if the tracking of the changes is automatic with all those bits of state that come together, you can save a lot of work. Uh, I shall now switch to some actual code, which hopefully will be readable. Hooray, it is. Let's make it a little bit bigger for you guys. Do I have to scroll it? There we go. Okay. So we have two properties, width and height, and we have this function make bound property, which we pass an expression to. One of the values is an integer constant, and two of them are properties. And the clever thing here is that we can overload all the operators to pass values through. So you just write a normal expression, uh, you know, with, with, with the support operators, which is not everything, comes out in a second. And then the result is that we have a, we, we capture these properties inside this bound property and then automatically track their value change signals to update the result. And we're done. Having, having done the declaration, which again is in a, in a very nice, the, the, this one line captures the behavior of, of, of this bound property. If we have one for visible or enabled, again, there's one line that says, here's all the state this uses and how it interacts, which is very likely what your UX designer wrote and not what you would normally have to implement to go and get all those things to update. And of course, because it's a property, it has a value change signal we can connect to. So we can see the result uh, and it will be, be fired automatically whenever we read of these change. And that's more or less it. It works. Uh, so now I have to go and do, obviously, some exceptions. Uh, let's see if I can get you back on. Ooh, ah, it's going to be the challenge, isn't it? Oh, there we go. Uh, so what works in this kind of system? Because we had to do some operator loans to make this work. Well, the standard arithmetic functions, m lots of helpful things in STD like abs and clamp. So therefore, you can get like a minimum value, a maximum value, or a clamped value, again, as a bound property. Again, this happens very commonly in user interfaces where you've got some range and the thing should be what the user entered, but no bigger or smaller than the value. Um, but crucially, you can also pass any function to make bound property and a list of properties it depends on, and we'll capture those and track them. And then nicer than that, we have, unfortunately, a macro I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> uh, where you can set, say that there's a function here, a free function, and then say how it, how it interacts and tracks properties. So more or less, you can therefore start to capture own functions and, and say how they will process properties. So this means within reason, if you've built up a library of these, you can then go, and, as I uh, showed earlier, uh, have these come together and just write very nice declarative code, which then tracks all its dependent properties automatically. Uh, if you have something like a 3D rendering engine, which is what we're building, you, the original was kind of the launch reason for this or the reason to create it, uh, you might have situations where you don't want to do all your updating at once or like in, instantaneously. So we actually have the notion of an evaluator. You can pass a evaluation object to each uh, bound property and then only update them lazily. Again, this happens very commonly in 3D engines because lots of properties change. You want to say, okay, go and evaluate all the updates this frame, which might, might be a few. Um, especially for something like a viewport, if the width and height change and the position, you don't want to do work four times. You want to wait until the, all of those things have, have happened and then do some updating. So we can do basically lazy evaluation. But the default is to do immediate evaluation because that's what you want. Uh, some practicalities. Yeah, it's a header-only library. It's MIT licensed. It's on GitHub. It needs to have C++ 17. Um, more or less give it a go. We've already had contributions, but we're kind of hoping to yeah, get it out there, get some feedback, uh, and see if anyone else wants to use it, because yeah, be more interesting that way. And of course, because the next thing there, we have a bunch of future extensions planned. Uh, so I'm actually originally an Apple coder, and Apple have a very similar system called key value coding and key value observing, and it can support containers. So you can go and observe the fifth element in a vector, I like that kind of stuff. And that's really useful and cool, but a bit of a pain to support because it means teaching this stuff about SDL containers and positions in them. So that's a planned possible step forward. Um, and then also multi-threading gets a little bit fun in this. Again, for user interface, we can usually stick to a single thread. To use this more widely, we need to think about cross-thread signals and cross-thread property bindings. It's planned but not been done yet, but it's on the roadmap. Um, yeah, end of file. I'm pretty good for time. That's good. Uh, I think I can take any questions. Cool. 
Easy. Thank you. Uh, it doesn't detect cycles right now. If you, make, if you make a cycle, you'll discover pretty quickly. But yeah, there, there's no cycle detection. I'm trying to think it would be possible. So internally we build... Oh, it should be possible, because internally we build a node graph, and we could, we could do a, a check for loops, and if the same node is in the, is in the dependency chain to say, this isn't going to work. Um, yeah. Um, not that I've found so far. I'm trying to work out, like, so the question was about if reentrancy is an issue. Uh, again, the current setup basically makes all threading your problem, or it assumes you work in a single, single thread context, so we don't have to track it. I, yeah, I'm, I'm going to say it's all right. <laughs> Thank you very much.